Most people think building a SaaS means raising a round, hiring a team and spending a year coding before you see your first customer. That's the slow lane. Micro SaaS flips that script. It's lead, targeted and profitable much faster, often in just three to four months. And the best part, you do not need a big team or millions in the bank. I have seen solo founders launch a single feature Chrome extension that pays their rent every month. One of my favorite examples, a founder spotted the same pain point coming up again and again in a Slack community, built a lightweight solution in six weeks and hit $3,000 MRR within 90 days. No complex dashboard, no bloated feature set, just one problem solved better than anyone else. If you're still looking for the right idea, I've shared multiple videos on proven profitable microsas ideas. You can check those out. Today we are talking execution. How to take that idea and turn it into paying customer in 16 weeks or less. Hey, I'm Swarnendu, co-founder of Innofied and All Right Apps. And here we talk SaaS, AI and product strategy, architecture every week. So please subscribe to the channel for more SaaS stories every week. Now let's talk about the stages needed to build a micro SaaS. Stage number one, MVP scope and positioning. This is where a lot of first time founders burn through their budget. They try to build everything at once. Instead, I follow the one killer feature rule. Focus on one core action that your user needs to solve their problem. Everything else, Dashboards, custom reports, AI summaries can wait until you have caught real users and real revenue. And to get there, use the must, should, could framework. Must have, without it, the product doesn't solve the problem. Should have, nice enhancements but not essential for launch. And could have, wish list for later versions. A good MVP should feel almost too small, but that's the point. The smaller your scope, the faster you launch. For example, a productivity SaaS I advise started with just one Google Calendar integration. That was enough to solve the core scheduling pain for their audience. Only after they nailed retention did they expand to Outlook, Slack and Zoom. Positioning is just as critical. You should be able to explain your product in one sentence. It's like a well-known tool, but for a specific audience or problem. If it takes more than that, your scope is probably too big or too vague. By the end of this stage, you should have a clearly defined core feature set, a simple positioning statement, and a user story map that makes onboarding to first success seamless. Stage number two, architecture and build plan. At this point, your Microsoft idea is validated. The next move is locking down your build plan. What stack we will use, how it will scale and how you will avoid wasting time on features nobody asked for. And here is the rule, shift first with tools you already know or can learn in days, not months. Scalability is a future problem. Speed to market is today's priority. For a technical founder, that might look like front-end with React with Tailwind UI or Vue with Vuetify for rapid UI work, back-end Node.js with Express or Django REST framework if you prefer Python, database PostgreSQL for reliability or Firebase if you want less setup, hosting Varsal for the front-end, Railway or AWS Light Cell for the backend. For non technical founders, no code is the time to market game. You can use a platform like Bubble or Webflow for the core app, database Airtable or Glide Tables. And for automation, you can use Zapier or Make.com to stitch workflows together. Take Coins for example. They built their first operational version entirely on Bubble. No code. No engineering team. That MVP brought in 1000 plus paying users before they even considered a custom build. So here's the pro tip. Before committing to a stack, 
check stackshare.io to see what similar SaaS products are using. It's free and it's how many founders avoid painful re-architecture later. Stage 3, MVP development. This is where too many founders derail, adding just one more feature before launch. A true MVP only delivers the single most valuable outcome your user cares about. Everything else is a distraction. So your checklist for a first functional MVP should be user authentication. Don't reinvent it. Use Firebase Auth or Superbase or Auth0. And then second, core features only. If your app is a booking system, it books, not books plus analytics plus loyalty points. Third, you should have a simple interface. Ship with a clean UI kit, maybe Tailwind UI or Material UI or and design instead of hiring a designer for eight weeks. Fourth, payments. Stripe checkout or Paddle lets you take money on day one. Fifth, admin panel. Skip custom dashboards. Retool or forest admin can handle operations early on. A founder I know launched a contract signing SaaS in six weeks using Firebase for all, Stripe for payments, and Retool for admin. It did one thing, PDF upload and e-sign. No integrations, no dashboards, and that single function was enough to close paying clients and gather targeted feedback. So if you are not tracking time to market at this stage, you are missing the point. Every extra week of build is a week without real users. Stage number four, private beta and early validation. Before you open the floodgates, you need controlled exposure. A private beta lets you see how your product performs in the wild without burning your launch momentum. Keep your beta group small. 10 to 25 people so you can personally review their behavior and feedback. This should be people who match your target audience and ideally came from your earlier validation interviews. Your beta toolkit should include canny or product board for structured feedback, hodger or full story to watch how users actually interact, mix panel or post hoc for quantitative metrics like activation and retention. One onboarding SaaS avoided a major churn problem in beta when full story reveal most users keep a key setup step. They redesigned the flow and activation jumped from 60% to 84% before launch. That's the kind of fix you can only make if you are measuring and observing early. So during beta, track three numbers above all. Number one, time to first success. How long from sign up to first meaningful value? Second, feature adoption. Which functions matter, which do not? And third, friction points, where people stop, get confused, or drop off. By the end of the stage, you should have a product that's not just working. It's proving it can solve a problem you set out to fix. And only then is it ready for a broader release. Stage number five, launch and customer acquisition. Your product works, your beta users are happy. Now it's time to get it in front of paying customers. The base launches are planned, not improvised. You need both visibility spikes and steady inbound channels from day one. So here's the launch playbook that I recommend. Number one, product hunt. Perfect for early adapter feedback. Look at how Cron and Type Dream position themselves with a clear one line value prop and strong visuals. Second, content marketing. Publish two, three high value blog posts answering your target users top search queries. Tools like Ahrefs or Uber Suggest will give you exact phrases to target. Third, direct outreach. Email your LinkedIn contacts, early interviewees, and community members. Keep it personal and problem-focused, not 
cell C. Fourth, niche communities. Post in relevant Slack, Discord and Reddit groups where your audience already hangs out. Fifth, SEO foundation. Optimize your landing page for one high intent keyword. Over time, this compounds into free traffic. Now here is an example. When Email Octopus launched, they skipped paid ads and focused entirely on email marketing forums, small business Facebook groups and guest posts. That free approach brought them their first 5000 users. So here are the tools that you can use right now. For landing pages, use TypeDream, Framer or Webflow. For email outreach, you can use Instantly.ai or Lamelist. And to launch coordination, you can use Notion or Trello. Stage number six, flywheel growth plan. The launch is only the start. Long-term growth in SaaS is a flywheel, not a funnel. Every user you acquire should help bring in the next one and make the product more valuable. And here is how to design that loop. First, acquire. Continue country marketing, SEO and targeted outreach. Add low budget retargeting ads to bring back visitors who did not convert. Second, activate. Your onboarding must guide users to the aha moment first. Tools like user flow or app queues can deliver in-app tools without extra development work. Third, retain. Run automated check-ins using intercom or customer.io to keep users engaged. Fourth, expand. Offer feature-based upsells or add-on modules once customers are getting value. Fifth, refer. Incentivize referrals with tools like Rewardful or Referral Candy. Here is an example. Calendly's growth was 100% product led. No big sales teams. Their free trial was sticky enough that users invited others. Each invitation becomes a new acquisition point. That's a flywheel in action. Stage number seven scaling and continuous improvement. At this stage, you are no longer guessing. Your numbers tell you exactly where to optimize. So here are the metrics to track. First, monthly recurring revenue. How fast you are growing revenue. Second, customer acquisition cost. Is your acquisition still effective? LTV, lifetime value. Are customers staying and paying long enough to be productive? And fourth, churn the single biggest killer of SaaS growth. Now here are the scaling actions you can take. First, automate repetitive workflows with Zapier, N18 or Make.com which can replace manual operations. Next, you can optimize hosting cost, move to committed use cloud instances or explore serverless to handle spikes. And then you expand channels, test affiliate marketing, partnerships or integration marketplaces with Shopify, Zapier or HubSpot. Here's an example. Buffer hit a plateau after initial growth. Instead of adding random features, they double down on analytics and queue management, features that directly improve retention. Churn dropped, LTV went up and acquisition spend becomes more efficient. So guys, building your first micro SaaS isn't about chasing every feature hiring the biggest team or raising funding before you have even written a line of code. It's about discipline. Moving from idea to launch with a focus, testing every assumptions in the real world and making each stage fit the next. The founders who win in this space do not get lucky. They shift fast, listen harder than they talk and treat early users as partners in shaping the product. They build a system, the architecture, the team model, the growth loop that compounds over time. If you have found this breakdown useful and you want more deep dives into SaaS, AI, product strategy and architecture, please subscribe to the channel so you do not miss what's coming next. 
because if you follow this process you will avoid the traps that kill most early SaaS products over engineering feature block and neglecting customer journey and you will give yourself the best shot at doing what every founder wants a product that pays for itself and grows while you sleep that's the beauty of micro SaaS. small baits tight execution and a flywheel that only spins faster the longer it runs. Thank you.